Good morning, Northsiders and friends. It's wonderful to be with you on this second Sunday of Christmas when we are celebrating Epiphany. Let us know in the chat if you are with us and share a greeting with other worshipers. If you are worshiping on YouTube, please like and subscribe our channel. This morning we welcome our friend, Dr. Lewis Oswald, as Tony is on vacation for two weeks. So we are blessed to have our friend with us for the next couple of weeks leading us in worship. Epiphany is often represented by a star, like the one illuminated in the baptistry, or the one we have on the banner, or the star words to be chosen as intentions this year during children's time. The star that the Magi follow to find the Christ child. As such, it is a season of growing light as we recognize that the light of the world has come through the birth of Jesus Christ. I hope this morning you will recognize Christ as the light of your life and consider how you might follow him this year. This morning we share in Christian sympathy with Sylvia Smith, who lost her sister Peggy Towns on December the 26th. And I would encourage you to take a look at our announcement sheet this week and consider how you might pray for those who are listed under prayer concerns. Also, consider getting in on one of our Zoom calls on Wednesdays at either 10 a.m. or 6 p.m. During these times, we check in with each other on how our week is going and we pray together. If you are looking to deepen relationships and deepen your prayer life in the new year, this is a terrific opportunity to do so. Our sanctuary has looked beautiful during these seasons of Advent and Christmas, hasn't it? But, alas, before next Sunday, it will come down so it can then be adorned for the three deacon ordinations that we have in January. This afternoon, we will set out the poinsettias in front of the sanctuary, so come by and pick up as many as you would like. With care, they can last for about a month or longer. Lastly, thank you, Northsiders, for your generosity in 2020. We have stayed up with our budget, given above and beyond to the Benevolence and AV Fund, and most recently have exceeded our $30,000 goal for our Advent Missions offering. And I'd like to draw your attention to our Advent Missions offering. As you remember, our gifts will go to support CBF Disaster Relief, CBF Field Personnel Rick and Lita Sample, the Mississippi Food Network, local immigrants through the Sacred Heart Parish, and Salt and Light Ministries in Honduras. Each of these ministries will be able to continue to do their work because of your generosity. Let that sink in for a moment. In a year that has promoted nothing but scarcity, we, together as a community, offered abundance. And thanks be to God for that. Not only did you surpass the goal of 30,000, but you vastly exceeded it, raising $37,862. Glory to God in the highest heavens. May we worship our God with a spirit of thanksgiving, illuminated by the ever-growing light of Christ. Let us worship together.
In this time, a new year, let there be hope. In this time of epiphany, let there be light. Now, dear God, we ask you, we ask that you hear us as we pray the prayer your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The witness of the scripture is from Psalm 72. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to a king's son. May he judge your people the righteousness and your poor with justice. May the mountains yield prosperity for the people and may the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the needy, and crush the oppressor. May he live with the sun indoors and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he be like rain that falls on the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In, these, in his days, may righteousness flourish and peace abound until the moon is no more. May the kings of Tarshish and the isles render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all the kings fall down before him and nations give him service. For he delivers the needy when they call, the, the poor and those who have no helper. He has pity on the weak and the needy. From, and saves the, the lives of the needy. From oppression and violence, he redeems their life and precious in their blood in his sight. And from Ephesians 3, this is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, 
for surely you have already heard of the commission of God, grace that was given me for you, and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I wrote above in a few words of the mystery, of the mystery, no, I'm sorry, as I wrote in above in a few words, a reading of which all enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this ministry, this mystery was not made known to humankind. It has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and the sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of the gospel, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace, that has given me by the working of his power. Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace has given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to, to make everyone see uh, what is the plan of, of the church the wisdom in its rich or variety um, might now be known to, to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance and with the eternal purposes that he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you to God. Before sinners hear the sign 
Please join me as we read responsively from Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come away far and away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba shall come. May we confess our sins before God and one another. God, our guide, who once used a star to lead people to Christ, we confess our poor sense of direction. We let ourselves become easily confused, easily distracted, and lose our way. We fail to follow the signs you provide. Forgive us our waywardness, O God. Lead us to the Christ so that we may follow his way to you. Friends, our God is faithful to receive our confession and grant us forgiveness. Hear this assurance of pardon. The true light has come into the world. We are the children of God through belief in Christ's name. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. I'd like to invite any children to participate in children's time. And as you do, I'd like to invite any grown-ups or kids 
to put um, whatever their star word was from last year in the comments section on Facebook. Last year, my star word was release. R-E-L-E-A-S-E, -E -E, release. Like I'm letting go of something with my hands. Now, friends, that's really hard for me because I am a planner. I love to know exactly what steps to do and in what order to do them. Even on vacation, I plan everything, every amount of time and how we're going to get there and back up routes in case it doesn't work out. I love a plan and I love to be in control because I feel like if I'm in control, nothing bad can happen. Nothing's going to come unexpectedly. I'll be okay. So my word from last year was really, really hard for me because to release something recognizes that we don't have control. It recognizes that our plans can sometimes get messed up. And it means that I need to follow God. In our sanctuary today, you'll see lots of stars. And I'd encourage you, friends, as the rest of the service goes on, count to see how many you can see. And they'll show up in very surprising places. I don't want to give it all away. God put a star in the sky to lead wise people, magi, to Jesus. And they had to follow the star. They had to release the plans that they had and trust that God would lead them to Jesus. That's our challenge too, is to follow the star, to follow Christ's light. And how might we do that? We can learn a lot from scripture. We can learn from other wise people around us. Maybe your Sunday school teacher or your friends from church or your parents or grandparents. We can pray and ask God how we might be led. And I think, too, we can release our expectations. Now, I have new star words for this year for everybody. So if you would have one of your parents email me, you can pick one up at the church, your star word for this next year. Or I can email it to you or mail it to you. But I want to be sure that everybody who wants a star word this year gets one. And grown-ups, you're invited to this too. And so I'm going to pick my star word for this year. Let's see. My star word is here. H-E-R-E. -E. I don't know what this is going to mean for this year. Maybe by next epiphany, I'll be able to share with you what it meant for me this year. I hope that you will have a star this year. And I hope that star is Jesus. You follow him each step of the way. Thanks, friends. You can go back with your families now. Please stand for the witness of the gospel. The gospel is, is reading John 1, 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came in, into being through him, and with him, and without him, not one thing came into being. What has come through him and without him, not one thing came into to being. Was coming to being in him was life. And the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He has came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light, the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, 
yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who are born not of the blood or the will or of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived through among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace from upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. This is the gospel of, the, of our Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Our pastor Courtney has given us a blessing each Sunday, the two and a half years she has been with us, that is rather singular. She says, know that you have been welcomed here, not in spite of who you are, but precisely because of who you are, a beloved child of God. We have come to expect it and feel the power of its message each week deep in our bones. It has been good to hear it in this year that has been 2020. My own particular blessing, which you have heard less frequently, but I hope has also encouraged you, is this. And it is inspired in part by the gospel reading of today, John 1, the message of the Incarnation. You are not alone. We are not alone. God is with us. Let us pray. Almighty God, you are with us, have been with us all the live long days of 2020, in the years before and now and in the years to come. These have been long days full of confusion and fear and sorrow. There has also been joy and kindness, care given and received, and that is when we have seen you most clearly. Open our eyes and hearts today to hear what you would say as we begin again in a new year to follow Christ. Amen. The first chapter of John that Samir read for us is poetry, uniquely so of all the gospel prologues by the gospel writers. And only John names Jesus by the Greek word logos, which means the word. Matthew Henry in his commentary on John says, The plainest reason why the Son of God is called the word 
seems to be that as our words explain our minds to others, so was the Son of God sent in order to reveal his Father's mind to the world. That is one interpretation among many. Many attempts to make plain or accessible what John gives us from the very beginning. A gospel full of mystery, life, light, glory, grace, truth, and revelation. Beautifully and lyrically stating some important theological truths about Jesus. In these 18 verses, we hear that Jesus is identical to God co-creator with God, was God as a real, living, breathing person. John clearly states that in Jesus, God came in human flesh to live among human beings as a fellow human being. R. Allen Culpepper in his commentary on the gospel and writings of John states that by any standard, The prologue to the Gospel of John is one of the most profound passages in the Bible. As simple as its language and phrases are, its description of Jesus as the Logos has exerted a lasting influence on Christian theology. He further concludes, all the prologues serve to educate or prepare the reader for the rest of the Gospel. Important themes are signaled and the identity of Jesus is established at the very outset by means of Christological titles, divine portents, or the manner of Jesus' birth. All the prologues, therefore, are Christological affirmations, but John is the only gospel to speak of Jesus' pre-existence. Matthew begins with a recitation of of ancestors. Mark is off to the races with a full-grown Jesus being baptized to initiate his ministry, and Luke gives us the elaborate and beloved birth story of our Lord. But John heralds Jesus through a poem as before all things, in all things, and most importantly, the one who is identical to God co-creator with God, who has made God known in fullness, fully God, and completely flesh. In Christ, God dwelt, lived, lodged, tabernacled, stayed, abided, inhabited, settled, had his home with us, moved into the neighborhood with us, took up residence with us as a real, living, breathing human being. Only poetry is sufficient for such mystery and such truth. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. The idea that God is with us has real significance for humanity for many reasons, especially to 21st century folk caught up in a worldwide pandemic, but in particular because we are told that when in our desperate need God drew near, nearer than we could ever have asked or imagined, God came near and is always coming near to us no matter what happens. In his book, Flesh, Bringing the Incarnation Down to Earth, the author Hugh Halter tells the story of taking his teenage daughter to get her first tattoo. While watching, Halter asks the tattoo artist these two questions. So, why do you think people tend to get so many tattoos? And why is the art of tattooing growing exponentially around the world. He said that the artist responded rather thoughtfully, he thought, he said, because it's something permanent etched on someone's flesh that can't be stolen 
taken away or corrupted. It's unique to them, deeply, irrevocably theirs, and represents a story that has formed them, or at least means something to them. When someone lets me etch something meaningful on their dermis, that means a lot to me and should mean even more to them. Skin matters a lot. That is profoundly true, isn't it? Skin matters a lot. In reading and thinking about the incarnation that John tells, I came across another writer, John Allen, who brought into his study of John chapter 1 the unique perspective of Native American spirituality. He suggests that the incarnational intentions of God be beyond, behind the glorious vision of John can be seen not as a one-time altering of history, which is our natural tendency, but rather as a continual unfolding. It is God's intention, Alan says, to become like the stuff of this world and live in specific moments in our world, in our communities, in our lives. The challenge to contemporary Christians in this vision of the incarnation is to talk a little less and let their words take on some flesh and skin and live in the world. Inspired by his reading of Native American Vine Deloria, specifically his book, God is Red, Alan suggests further. God intends that his story gets lived out in recognizable ways in the world. In the specific ways we engage the broken places in our communities and the simplest interactions we have with our neighbors. And that God's presence would become unmistakable because the faithful have put their bodies into what they believe. That the faithful embody justice and love in the world, not just by our words, but by living it out, showing up in the world we inhabit as the people we are. Making God known in the flesh again and again and again. This is each one of us doing the unique embodiment of God wherever we are. In the families we have, in the jobs we have, with the neighbors we have, and with the strangers we meet every day. And as anyone who is a human being and lives with human beings knows, that is not easy, is it? In the book, The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor, Dostoevsky, a wealthy woman asks the elder of a monastery how she can really know that God exists. The elder tells her that no explanation or argument can achieve this, only the practice of active love. He assures her that there really is no other way to know God in reality but this kind of love. The woman confesses that sometimes she dreams of a life of loving service to others. She thinks perhaps she will become a sister of mercy, live in holy poverty, and serve the poor in the humblest way. It seems to her such a wonderful thought that it makes tears come to her eyes. But then it crosses her mind how ungrateful some of the people she is serving are likely to be. They will probably complain that the soup she is serving isn't hot enough, or that the bread isn't fresh enough, or that the bed is too hard and the covers too thin. She confesses that she couldn't bear such ingratitude, and so her dreams of serving others vanish. And once again, she finds herself wondering if there really is a God. To this, the elder responds, Love in practice is a harsh and dreadful thing compared to love in dreams. The incarnation, though mysterious and at, it, at risk of being reduced to a dreamy 
Christmas story presents that kind of harsh and dreadful love of God. When God put on flesh, God experienced life, joy and beauty, wonder and pleasure, but also weakness, being subject to heat, cold, hunger, poverty, need, work, betrayal, pain, suffering, and death, all for the sake of us, people who are sadly often ungrateful or unmoved by God's presence as we go about our lives, making our choices, even our resolutions for a new year. You and I could not have predicted the year that was 2020, and we have no crystal ball predictions as to what 2021 will be like, what the unexpected demands it will make of us. But we who have lived through the darkness of 2020 have also seen light. We have seen the light of life, the light of the world, God with us. And so we begin again, knowing that we are not alone, that God is with us, that we are his beloved children, and that God continues to live God's story through us in big ways and small. As Courtney said, your generous gifts to our Advent offering have been good news. I hope you can imagine what good news it will be to those who receive those monies soon. But I also want to thank the people who did a small thing, perhaps. They put together a Christmas stocking for 25 immigrant children whose families were affected by the ice raids of 2019. As I said, it seems a small thing, and maybe you've already forgotten that you did it. But for those children, it was something big. It was a loving and happy gift to heal some of the hurt and sorrow that they have felt. You continue to live God's story to them. And in this year, some of you have paid someone's light bill or their rent. Some of you have called someone who lives alone to just talk things over, to let them hear a voice at the other end of the line. And some of you have prayed all alone for us, for this church, for this community, for this world. And no one saw but Jesus. But still, you put flesh to God's story. The incarnation certainly can be explained better by folks much wiser than me, but I believe it all comes down to skin, and skin matters an awful lot. The Word became flesh And dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. If the world is to know that God has come near, then we have work to do that will require some skin on our part. The author, philosopher, theologian, educator, and civil rights leader Howard Thurman wrote a wonderful poem for this season of the church. And I read it to you now as a clarion call to each of us as we step into this new year, a year that invites us to live out God's story again, to take steady steps forward, and to follow Christ in a world that has not yet been made whole. The Work of Christmas by Howard Thurman. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, 
to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among all, to make music in the heart. This morning, the year 2021 is fresh born. What it will be is unknown to us, but we know what our work will be, that we are beloved children of God and that we are not alone. Amen. As we prepare for communion, we're going to enter into a time of prayer. The Religious Society of Friends, also known informally as Quakers, have a way of praying that I admire. They call it holding someone in the light. When I don't know what to pray or how to pray, I try to use this tradition and hold whomever God has placed on my heart in the light. What better time to think of praying in this way than on Epiphany? As we go to the Lord in prayer, as we consider the work of Christmas to be done, as we consider God putting on flesh and dwelling among us, I would like for you to take a moment and ask God to bring names of people to your mind. Maybe there's someone that you did help or pray for, as Susan mentioned in her sermon. Maybe it's one of those children who received a stocking. Take a moment and ask God to put them in your heart. Let their names and faces come to you. Even if you don't know their name or their face. And hold them in the light. Lord, on this day, we stand in awe of your growing brightness, dazzling us and drawing us to our knees in adoration and worship. God, you were and are and always will be. You are eternal. Yet you draw us in through the incarnation, becoming flesh, putting on skin and dwelling among us. Who are we that are, we are worthy of such a beautiful gift? Guide us, O oh God, like you guided the Magi by the star. Give us markers along our path to determine if we are going your way. Point out to us the Herods in our world who seek to destroy what you have planned. Grant us discernment to know when it is time to speak back to those voices and when it is time to go home by another way. Lord, even as we are humbled by your presence, we pray that your warmth may come to those we love and who we believe need you now. So we pray for the sick, for the recovering, for the grieving, those who are lonely, those in positions of leadership, those who lack food, shelter, or finance. Those who have been on the front lines of the pandemic. And for those whose names and faces we hold in your light. O oh, light of the world pre-existent one made flesh in Jesus Christ, be born in us today, guided by the Holy Spirit and to the glory of God the Father. Amen. As we come now to the time of communion, Gather the elements that you might have at home. And as you do, remember that this is not Northside's table. 
but it is God's table. And God's table is strong enough to carry any of our burdens. God's table is wide enough to welcome all of God's people. And God's table is level enough to give us a foretaste of the justice of the kingdom of God. So we give you thanks. On the night of his arrest, Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thanks be to God for this holy gift. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ Christ is risen. Christ Christ will come come again. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. Dying, you you destroyed destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Please stand and join me in the offering prayer. For all you have given us, for all you have done for us, for all who is in the earth, for all who are will, do all you are given, and for all you miss the end. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Oh, uh-huh. 
friends and family of Northside, we hope that you have been able to worship with us, that you have felt a warm welcome from us, even though we are distant. And so now, receive this blessing. Brothers and sisters, you are not alone. We are not alone. God is with us. So go, wherever your steps take you, and put on Put skin onto God's story and live God's story in unmistakable ways. Amen.